Again, thank you for joining us. I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education, and we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series over at Fairhaven Senior Services um, ever since 1983. So we've been doing this for quite a while, even though this semester we're doing things quite differently. Um, we're holding our live lectures uh, via WebEx, um, so some people are joining us virtually in the audience. We're recording the lectures, and then they will be shown um, a few days from now. So today uh, we have the lecture on Monday the 15th and it'll be shown uh, in Fairhaven on this coming Friday. Uh, so thank you for joining us, whether you're here live now or whether you're with us in a few days from now. This semester, we're sort of telling you that you can travel with no passport required. You can travel um, across the globe and throughout time. We're going to uh, kind of get out of our chilly Wisconsin winters and 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 explore some other parts of the world um, throughout time. And um, today we're fortunate to have Dr. James Coons with us. Jim Coons is a historian of early modern Europe with a focus on 17th century France, especially in the early years of Louis XIV's reign between 1643 and 1661. His research has focused on the ways in which personal identities or qualities uh, become implicated in political conflicts. His recent publications have investigated the ways in which France's prime minister reported on his laughter or sarcasm in diplomatic negotiations and the ways in which pamphleteers played on the emotions of anxious Parisians in the midst of rebellion, molding them into a united community. His talk today is a new direction within the same broad interest, asking how legal scholars dealt with ambiguities surrounding the status of a potential royal heir, soon to be born to the wife of a convicted traitor serving France's enemies beyond her borders. Well, uh, it, it, please, uh, please listen to the lecture today, and if you have questions, you can put them in uh, the, the chat feature, and I'll cover those at the end of the lecture today. But please, uh, please join me in welcoming Jim. All right, thanks very much, Carrie. Um, so if uh, the overall theme is that uh, you can travel even while travel is hard and the weather is terrible, um, I'm, I'm here to tell you that that's not always without complications. Uh, so I'll look today at what happened to the exiled Prince of Condé, uh, when it turned out his wife was pregnant in 1656. Uh, so I've got a few slides to help illustrate some of the background points uh, to uh, the early part of my lecture, and then I'll switch over and you can um, have the privilege of looking at me for the rest of the time. So to begin, in May of 1656, a French princess learned that she was pregnant. Claire Clemence de Maillé Brézé, the Princess of Condé and wife of Louis II of Bourbon, the Grand Prince of Condé, would give birth before the end of that year. If she bore a son, the couple's royal blood would pass on to the newest prince of the cadet line of France's royal house, strengthening and ensuring the clear line of succession. Now, normally, this would have been met with unbridled joy and acclamation across France, for uncontested royal succession meant a peaceful transfer of power. By contrast, the chaos wrought by unclear inheritance was a living memory for many in France and indeed across Europe. Most recently in France, the reigning King Louis XIV had been dubbed le Dieu donné, the God given. Uh, that's an image of him here, sorry. Um, upon his birth in 1638, because his parents had long seemed unable or maybe unwilling to procreate. The arrival of an heir in their rather advanced age thus felt nothing short of miraculous. So assured succession was a major issue of stability and security for subjects of a dynastic monarchy. Adding even a second son to a secondary branch of the royal house would normally be cause for celebration. But there's going to be a lot of buts in this uh, in this talk. The child of the Grand Conde would be born into decidedly abnormal circumstances. The father, a first king to the uh, first cousin to the king and fourth in line to the throne, had once been an iconic hero. But for the past half decade, he had waged open war against the French crown on the pretense that Cardinal Minister Jules Mazarin had misled the young Sun King and usurped royal power. He even signed a treaty with Spain, France's greatest enemy of the past two centuries. In early 1654, Condé had been convicted in absentia of treason since he was off at the head of uh, Spanish troops at the moment, uh, and he was sentenced to death for his rebellion. 
Until that sentence could be carried out, though, he was legally stripped of all honors, titles, possessions, and even his last name of Bourbon, uh, since he shared it with the king and the king didn't want anything to do with him. Uh, as a result, the prince and his family uh, and their few remaining friends fled to Spanish lands in Flanders, where he took command of armies fighting France. This, then, was the situation when his, his child was conceived. The father, a former hero, sentenced to death and legally expunged from French society, but whose blood still carries the mystical quality of royalty, and whose wife and family existed in a judicial limbo thanks to their ties with the disgraced prince. That is, they, they sort of didn't have any guilt attached to them since they just followed their father or husband, um, but it was still a problem for them to be outside of France. More broadly, there, were, there was essentially no law defining citizenship in France at that moment. We'll get into that more in a moment. In sum, the news of his wife's pregnancy was cause for concern and confusion more than jubilation. What would all this mean for the royal family, for the child's status, for French politics at large, and most broadly for the perceived borders of France's community? So for my talk today, I wanna to use this particular case to talk about a much larger point. And I should stipulate up front, that this case actually turned out to be totally unimportant on its own. It's actually kind of barely a footnote in the most exhaustive biography of the Grand Condé. The child turned out to be a girl, and even worse, that's a little bit of early modern misogyny humor, sorry. Um, she died in infancy, so none of the speculation that I'll talk about today would actually matter. And yet, in the period when these people didn't know the end of the story, a princely family and their lawyers fretted intensely over how the child would be perceived and received as noble, royal, and most basically French at all. So I want to examine their anxieties as a way to clarify how an early version of citizenship could be conceived at a moment when clear definitions had yet to be written. Now, before I get too deep into these issues, um, here's the, the uh, ministers in, in, in question. Uh, before I get too deep into these issues, it's important to set up the backstory. Most immediately, you need to know that France in the 1650s felt like a kingdom on the brink, either of greatness or of ruin. The country had endured over a century of nearly nonstop internal conflict and outright civil war over religion, power, personal honor, or just plain ego. Coincidentally, the most distant as well as the most recent of the civil wars had been led by a man named Louis de Bourbon. In the 1560s, the first Louis de Bourbon had been the primary leader of the upstart Protestant faction of the Wars of Religion, while his grandson largely organized the most recent conflict, called the Fronde, which had ended only two years prior to the pregnancy that we're talking about today. So having overcome those civil wars, as well as seemingly never-ending tax riots and peasant revolts, the French crown had done much to consolidate power over its lands and subjects, especially with the guidance of the famed or perhaps infamous Cardinal Minister Richelieu and his equally divisive successor, Cardinal Minister Mazarin, uh, Jules Mazarin. Uh, the King of France enjoyed greater authority in 1650 than he had in 1550. But of course, it all depended on the man sitting on the throne. And in 1656, the jury was still very much out on the young Louis XIV. While some saw the potential for greatness, there were plenty of reasons to believe that he would be an unserious, frivolous monarch, more interested in ladies at court than with his royal duties. So for the time being, Cardinal Mazarin ran things, and he continued to do so until his death in 1661. And we should note up front, he hated the Prince of Condé, and he had ever since even before the Fronde, when the Prince had been France's most important and, vi and, and victorious general. Now, to be fair, the Prince had probably started it, and he hated Jules Mazarin right back. Um, he actually demanded uh, while he was in exile that people call his son, uh, whose name was uh, Henri Jules, uh, they, he demanded that they call him Henri Louis, uh, so that they could avoid saying Mazarin's first name in front of him. So the two men don't like each other. So to sum up the larger context, through a century of intrigues and catastrophes, France had endured, and its monarchy had emerged empowered with a veteran military underneath it. And I don't want to overemphasize the silver lining of a civil war, but their troops had done a lot of fighting. Meanwhile, the population was eager to move past the factions and divisions of the past century. But of course, it was all still up in the air whether they'd be able to. So across the many recent conflicts ran a common thread of fear of the other. This distrust of difference took many forms at different moments, a hatred of so-called heretics during the wars of religion, 
mistrust of foreigners, especially Spaniards and Italians, as it would happen, uh, after uh, several decades of perceived betrayals and intrigues. Mutual suspicion among partisans either of the rebels or the royal party during the Fronde. In short, there were many cleavages and many reasons for difference in France at this moment. But across this tumultuous landscape, even the law offered little assurance or solidity in defining who was truly French. There was actually no such thing as a legal uh, paradigm for citizenship or any formal legal, legal standard of belonging in 17th century France. Technically, there would be none until the fall of the monarchy in 1789. If you live in a kingdom, citizenship implies that you somehow participate in governing yourself, and that's anathema to an absolute monarch. So there just couldn't legally be any citizenship. Instead, there was a loose constellation of traditions and cultural assumptions about what belonging to France meant, and a smattering of penalties and what one scholar has called anti-privileges uh, that applied to foreigners living under the French crown. So we don't know who's French exactly, but we know who's foreign. These penalties and anti-privileges mostly had to do with property and inheritance, especially around what was called the droit d'Aubain. This was a provision that allowed the king to seize any property of a foreigner who died in France or of a Frenchman uh, who, uh, who left without an apparent intent to return. A foreigner who declared an intent to remain in France, obey French laws and serve the French king, might obtain what were called letters of naturalization from the king. But this was an exceptional case. It's kind of the exception that proves the rule, and one reserved for those with enough wealth and prestige to petition the monarch successfully. So, for example, Mazarin was born Italian, uh, and he had obtained his letters of naturalization from Louis XIII shortly before the king's death on his way to becoming a prime minister. Um, you didn't need to be about to be prime minister to get naturalized, but it was that level of individual who sort of had the uh, the wherewithal to get even you know, the time of day from the king to, to be in, in France. So by contrast, for most people born in France, there was no official status, no social security card or anything like that, that would indisputably prove your Frenchness. For nearly everyone, if you were born on French soil to French parents, you were French and it just never came up as a question, especially since most people in that age lived and died within about a day's uh, travel from their hometown. No law clearly laid out what importance soil, blood, tax paying, or whatever other consideration might hold in determining national belonging. So for this reason, the Condé offspring raised crucial questions, especially for a government and a nation that were just beginning to establish the kind of boundaries that would uh, define inclusion. So that's why I think this is an interesting and important case. At a turning point in the history of European nation states, political scientists usually define modern nations as beginning at about 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. So this is just after that. Um, so at this crucial moment, um, I lost my place, sorry. Uh, we have a chance to see what people thought might determine the status of a child born between two of Europe's most powerful countries. Now, as you might have heard, issues of citizenship and belonging have come up again here in the 21st century. So I think it's useful to look at this both as an origin story of nationality and as a way of asking why it was that one factor or another seemed to matter in a situation where there were really very few precedents to follow. So we come at last now, and let me quit sharing my story. Um, we come at last to the child of the Grand Condé. As soon as the family learned of the pregnancy, uh, they asked for legal counsel regarding their fraught circumstances. The archives of the Condé household preserve three anonymous legal briefs that all anticipate a similar set of concerns with the birth and attempt to chart a course to a satisfactory solution for the prince. And for the most part, they agree on the salient points. Uh, Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, they, for the most part, they agree on the salient points. They all think that birth outside of French soil could be a problem, which the princess should do her best to avoid uh, by asking permission to return to France. If possible, she should also deliver the child among the traditional aristocratic gathering, uh, or at least have local judges and notaries attest to the truth of the, of the delivery and paternity. These were apparently very serious concerns. <laughs> 
Similarly, her advisors all agree that the child would remain a member of the royal family for purposes of potentially inheriting the crown. That is because blood is a fact of nature. No decree by the king could strip the child of his royalty, assuming it was a boy. Uh, the, the authors of these memos speak about uh, uh, getting rid of his royal blood uh, almost as, as if it's preposterous as the, the king trying to issue a decree against gravity. Um, this was how important blood seemed to be in their mind. Now, I'll say a little bit more about blood in, in the future, but for now, you need to know that this is something they take quite seriously. Now, this concern for the royalty of the child's blood was certainly less a question of actually becoming king someday, since something like half a dozen uh, heirs before them would need to die first, um, but more an issue of rank. If you were royal, that mattered a lot, especially for potential future marriage possibilities with other uh, European ruling families, for which it would be crucial to establish the child's status as royal to avoid the appearance of a mismatch. Finally, on the question of the child's rank and status within France, or even acceptance as French, there is some dissent. One author assesses the prince's current disgrace as a major obstacle, while the others are more sanguine, we might even say naive, about the matter. So to summarize their agreement, these three jurists all see four basic terms in which the future child's identity would be reckoned. Blood, or the family's heritage, soil, or the location of delivery, recognition, or others' assent to their status, and affection, or the perception, most of all by the king, that the family and child would love and serve France and her ruler. Blood, soil, recognition, and love. They see the first three of these in roughly the same terms, all agreeing that a prince born, uh, excuse me, that a child born to a prince of royal blood on French soil and among other peers and nobles of France would be, at least legally or technically, a French aristocrat and able to inherit the crown. Though there were only customs and habits rather than laws to establish these standards, the views of these three authors are unanimous, and their arguments, at least to me, seem solid in the context of 17th century jurisprudence. Now, it's worth uh, spending some time examining the thinking behind the ideas of blood and land in early modern minds. Now, I'll leave the gathering of nobles that uh, she was supposed to deliver her child to uh, for, to one side, because as far as I can tell, that's just a technical measure to make sure that the child was who the parents claimed. You want to have some people there to say, oh, yeah, I saw this baby and it's really the right kid. But soil, to begin with, would have carried heavy meanings for educated people of the early modern world. In a culture bound up inextricably with biblical ideas, especially the notion of a promised or holy land was a common trope. And of course, everyone assumed that blessed geography was the same thing as their own homeland. These ideas of a holy land mingled with an assumption that different territories imparted different sorts of values or attributes in their people. And that explains why, for example, hot-blooded Italians or Spaniards are so irate all the time, and why it is that wintry Swedes or Germans are so sleepy, as we all know. More formally, Montesquieu could seriously posit a century later, in the midst of the purportedly rational enlightenment, that hotter climates lent themselves to slavery and tyranny, but temperate zones were suited to more balanced forms of government. Um, there's more to say about that, but I'll leave it uh, maybe for the questions. If you add on a further layer of formal religion for Roman Catholics, in which cities or regions might venerate a particular patron saint, we begin to understand why the location of birth would be more than a technical detail, and why the laws of this age might focus so heavily on territory. Now, similarly, ideas of blood were heavily freighted with meanings far beyond genealogy or patron, uh, parentage. Parallel to perceptions of land, perceptions of blood drew on religious, superstitious, and pseudoscientific ideas to inform political conclusions. Once again, biblical connotations conveyed the sacred power of blood, ranging from the Pharaoh's plagues to Christ's crucifixion. Moreover, even unschooled lay people in mostly Catholic France would experience a persistent reminder of blood's importance when they took communion only with the bread or body, while only those anointed, like the priest or a king, were given access to the blood or wine. For this reason, we can understand why rumors would swirl about the uses that witches or Jews purportedly made of Christian blood in their rituals. This is the origin of what's called blood libel. At the same time, it perhaps becomes comprehensible that noblemen claimed exemption from most taxes on the basis of the blood they and their order shed in battle. Moreover, 
it was believed or really known like a physical law that noble blood was actually different, purer, better for the commoners, such that medieval tra tradition held that royal blood was physically clear and luminous. That is like a king's blood glows in the dark. So to return to the Condé question, we can begin to understand the confidence that these authors had that not even a king's decree could change the absolute fact of a noble, let alone royal, child's blood. The assurance that a child born to French parents on French land would be accepted as French follows pretty inexorably from these starting points. On the question of affections and loyalty, though, there is a crucial divergence. The first two authors do address it, but in a limited way. They note that there is no precedent for a noble criminal, even a traitor's children suffering for the sins of the father after the fact. In cases where various gentlemen had transgressed in the past, they were punished, but their children were never injured. But the more pessimistic and I believe more accurate memo cautions that Condé's case is different and his misdirected, misdirected affection for Spain might overshadow all of considerations, even if the other factors were arranged perfectly. That is, even if his wife gets to come back, give birth in France, among all the nobles, all of that, even if everything else lines up right, Condé's uh, perceived love for Spain still might uh, trump everything else. So uh, this author observes, quote, children would be considered foreign following the submission or agreement that a father makes with a foreign sovereign, end quote. And it's telling here that he can only speak in terms of what would make Condé foreign rather than what would make him actually French. Again, there was no positive definition of inclusion within France. So with that, he continues, quote, in the case the children born after their father had renounced France could only be born as foreigners since freeborn children are judged according to the father's condition, end quote. Now he quickly hedges the statement with assurances that children of disgraced nobles have not been punished for their father's crimes. He agrees with the other theorists here. Um, and he, uh, so for example, the children of nobles who had allied with Spain during the wars of religion a century ago were legally unharmed by their parents' betrayal. Therefore, he concludes, the prince's living son should remain unscathed by his father's misdeeds. But he says nothing here about the, ex about the expected child, and that silence is ominous. As we learn soon, uh, soon after, that's for a good reason. In the case of the princess's current pregnancy, everything is still up in the air as a result of a technicality in the prince's sentence. Now, to be sure, Condé had been convicted, sentenced, and even burned in effigy in 1654 while his lands and belongings were assessed and repossessed. But because he did not appear at person at the trial, again, he's off leading uh, Spanish armies, the verdict was not technically final for five years, theoretically to allow him to defend himself in that time. Therefore, if Condé managed to return to France and win the king's forgiveness before the clock ran out, all guilt would be wiped away, along with any lingering questions about his recently born child's status. If not, however, any child born after the condemnation, so after 1654, would be cut off from the status, inheritance, and even place in royal succession they might otherwise enjoy. This author finds that, quote, being born to a prince who is not considered as such after his condemnation and regarded as legally dead by the state, it is impossible to be persuaded that the prince could give his children born after his condemnation that which he does not possess himself. So if the prince had been deprived of his status as noble, royal, French, or most basically as a living person insofar as the French crown was concerned, he could hardly give those things to any children born after he'd lost them any more than, he could, than his son could inherit the lands and goods that he had lost in the same ver verdict. They just weren't his to give. But this negative view goes further still. I would add, this jurist warns, that the considerable, considerable acts of hostility that Monsieur the Prince has committed as an enemy of the king and his state are not a small consideration in excluding his children. For these deeds, however illustrious, and Condé had won some pretty impressive battles for Spain, these deeds will only be considered by the French as proof of his rebellion and felony, which confirm his condemnation and validate the king's justice. So if a child's status derives from the father's loyalties at the moment of birth, and the father serves another sovereign, that is, loves another country, uh, and renders him foreign at that moment, 
any Conde offspring who came into the world after 1654 had no plausible argument to be considered French. For the sake of the unborn child, then, the author emphatically encourages the Conde family to do all they can to overturn the verdict before the 1659 deadline. Now, I want to pause here to emphasize the point that this author is making. In the event that social recognition, soil, and blood all said that the, French, that the child was a French royal, the fact of the father's hostility to France would outweigh all of those. And to be sure, this author, along with the other two, advises the princess to return to French territory, give birth among her peers, and check all the required boxes she can. But if the prince can't sort out his conviction and thus the legal weight of his hostility toward France and affection for Spain, all else is moot. In this author's view, and again, I believe he saw the situation much more clearly than the other two, the perceived love of France was the most important factor and perhaps the only important factor. This author places heavy weight on affection as determining belonging, and modern scholars agree that this was the primary concern at the time. In which I'd be happy to discuss the question and answer period, there are strong indications from recent years to confirm that everyday people agree that love for France and her king was the most important element in their acceptance of compatriots, what some historians have termed fellow feeling among the French. So, to begin to tie together some of the various strands in this case, I'll say that much of my interest in this comes from the two roads it presents on national belonging. Um, and though the authors wouldn't have seen it that way at the time, I really do think this is kind of a fork. One path relies on confirmable, objective facts of parentage and geography, while the other focuses on a hazier notion of personal connections and love between the subject and sovereign. So it's true that you can sort of squint and make out something like modern citizenship from this case. And certainly all three authors can uh, concur about the significance of the child's lineage, location of birth, as well as some rudimentary confirmation of those things by witnesses. Drawing on well-established ideas, excuse me, uh, drawing on well-established ideas about the meanings of blood and inheritance, as well as the soil of one's homeland, these writers piece together a model of innate belonging that we could recognize today. And for the purposes of building a systematic, neutral definition of citizenship, their logic makes sense. The verifiable facts of a child's extraction should matter, and at least in two of these authors' estimations, should primarily define one's status. It's an objective standard that a lawyer would understandably love. And it would be easy to assume that this was the model that won the day. Since Louis XIV's government is broadly seen as a more rational, bureaucratic, modernizing institution than those of his predecessors, Indeed, whole sociological models have been constructed around the presumption that the Sun King oversaw what's called a civilizing process at his court and across his kingdom as he dragged France toward modernity. And that may hold true in some cases, especially around finances and the army and things like that. But the third author's hesitancy about the prince's problematic love for Spain seems to me more on point in this instance in emphasizing the personal qualities and passions of both ruler and subject. On the one hand, he assumes Condé's hostility to France and affection for Spain will enter into the record as a legal fact and moreover as the controlling point for the whole case. At the same time, and in some ways applying the same logic, he advocates that the Conde family needs to do their best to placate the hatred between themselves and the king, or more accurately, Mazarin. Maybe he should start letting his kid get called uh, Henri Jules, so that he can at least win some permission for the princess to return uh, to France for her delivery, or ideally he could facilitate a larger reconciliation for the prince. That is, if the prince's emotions were the main problem for his and his offspring's acceptance, the simplest solution would be an, an appeal to the king's emotions to guarantee their legal status. Now, to finish this story more broadly, this third author turns out to have offered the best advice. Though, again, the daughter didn't survive infancy and the threat to Condé's status and wealth uh, as a whole compelled a hard-won reconciliation with the French crown. In fact, he managed to win a return with full restitution of his possessions and honors as part of the larger peace negotiations concluded between France and Spain in 1659, like just under the wire. His demands almost scuttled the talks, which by the way, included peace in a 25 year war, territorial exchange and Louis XIV's marriage to a Spanish princess. Uh, these were not a small matters. And Condé almost upset the whole apple cart 
but it got done, again, just in time. This showed, I would argue, a willingness by the crown to look at the big picture of the kingdom's benefit, even if that meant accepting a hugely distasteful trade-off. But it demanded a highly personalized exception to the law on the Sun King's part, and a high price in Gaul for Mazarin, and a formal apology from Condé. That is, all three men involved needed to give thing personally. Everyone paid a price they didn't enjoy, but everyone came out ahead. Mazarin cemented his legacy as a statesman. Louis wrenched territorial concessions from Spain in exchange for their, uh, to, to agreeing to their demands for Condé's return, and Condé himself salvaged his dynasty. And within a decade, he even regained the king's confidence to lead French troops to victory on, on the battlefield. But the means to get these outcomes operated within personal dynamics rather than regimented or bureaucratic logics. That is, Louis XIV continued to operate as a traditional, personal ruler and not as a more uh, modern executive administrator of the machinery of state. And at times, in the broader picture, that worked well, as in Condé's case. But at many other moments in his reign, the personal whims of the monarch proved to, proved to be a poor basis for policy. Um, he starts a pretty, uh, a couple pretty expensive wars just because he doesn't like the Dutch and the Spanish, um, and those turn out to be disastrous for his later reign. So while we tend to associate centralizing power, uh, in, uh, centralizing state power with historical progress, depending how it's organized and carried out, this power can in fact step backward from what we take to be modernity. In that sense, I think this case is fascinating as a minor instance of a detour in the history of national identity, government function, and legal procedure. But the actual substance of the case is worth thinking about too here in 2021 when it means when what it means to belong to a nation has again become a pressing issue. There has lately been some concern that America's reliance on uh, jus soli, the law of soil, might lead to abuses like so-called anchor babies, which as far as anyone can tell is almost totally non-existent. Um, that is that, that we've sort of overextended this idea of soil, birth on American soil, conferring citizenship automatically. On the other hand, many nations focus on blood, including fairly extreme instances like Israel's law of return that grants birthright citizenship for children of even a single Jewish parent, or Ireland's foreign births register that allows even grandparents to confer Irish nationality on grandchildren, potentially skipping a generation of non-Irish parents. Now, while these might be handy mechanisms for American soccer players looking for transfers to top European leagues, this has actually happened a couple of times recently, um, they also expand the borders of legal community beyond what most Irish, Israeli, or at times American citizens consider the real community of their nation. I likewise vividly recall the chorus of America, love it or leave it, uh, in the early 21st century, which hasn't fully subsided in the intervening deck uh, in, in, in the couple years since uh, 2000, which calls back again to the Grand Condé's problems of loyalty and affections in the 1650s. In any event, we see no further along in coming up with the basic terms of citizenship than the French jurists we've encountered today. We still rely, legally or socially at least, on soil blood or love, although at least we've uh, done some to nail down rigorous demands for confirmation instead of just people showing up at the birth. So what I hope to convey in my talk today is uh, the sort of arcane and ultimately fruitless debate over this, uh, over this prince's kids. I want to convey that making rules about national belonging has always been hard. From the Romans who first innovated the modern version of citizenship to modern immigration debates, People have never had an easy time making laws that include some and exclude others and making them line up perfectly with the expectations of those already within the nation. Though I'm still early in this line of research, my interest has begun to point toward the circumstances that surround those debates at various moments. So in the case of a society facing stark internal divisions like France in the immediate wake of a civil war, the instinct to demand that a citizen love and serve the nation is understandable. For a nation seeking to expand its borders or its population, such as a newly founded state like Israel, casting a very wide net might be sensible. But as a historian, I can tell you with confidence that the circumstances that make a particular set of laws or attitudes sensible at one moment are going to be a poor match at some other moment. And so I'll close with the thought that debates over citizenship, whether regarding a disgraced prince or displaced refugees, 
say less about the pursuit of some objectively ideal set of laws or the worthiness of a potential immigrant, and more about the conditions that those within the society feel they're facing themselves. So uh, with that, I'm eager to answer any questions you might have about this case or the history of citizenship more broadly. Thank you. Wow, that was that was really fascinating. I didn't think I would. Uh, I, I'm starting to be able to connect the dots to to modern, th you know, modern situation. And there's we have another um, lecture coming up in this series that talks about emigration, and uh, the lecture is a uh, Midwest visa, you know, uh, welcoming mm -hmm. people. And I, and I and and I never thought I would connect those two lecture topics, but it seems clear that 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 they very much are. So that was really fascinating um, to you. think of it that way. I, I also caught myself uh, thinking, um, wow, this would make a really great mini series or something like that. A lot of, <laughs> drama, a lot of, a lot of players. <laughs> There's a lot of drama in this story. Um, this is this is just a little snippet of it. It's uh, for my money not even the best, but it's yeah. what I have to talk about today. <laughs> That's cool. Um, I wanted to I'm remind the to people in our audience uh, that if you if you do have a question, you can enter it in the chat box, and I'll convey that uh, to Professor Coons. So please feel free to to enter your questions in the chat box. I I I don't know if the other people in the audience are like me, where now I feel like I'm going to have questions like a day from now because I'm like. <laughs> you know, soaking it all in, like, you know, it, it sounds like something that happened you know, 400 years ago, but it's so relevant now because when you just start to change the terms just a little bit, you know, declaring your love for the nation. I mean, we, you know, we, when you get citizenship in the US, you have to learn all this and you have to, you, you know, mm -hmm. pass these exams and stuff. But if you're born here, you don't have to do any of that, you know? So um, it, it's really interesting. Yeah, we've, we've We've sort of have, uh, you know, knowledge of American history, or civics or something stand in for for some assumed love of the country. But I, I think it's doing a lot of the same work or at least trying to, um, however successfully we might think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just fascinating yeah. to think, too, that, like, you know, you, you sort of outline these four components um, and how at times one of those components are are more important or more relevant than another or mm -hmm. or to to this nation or to that nation um and i wonder how much even now going back uh you know when we have all this science that can prove what your bloodline is or you know where that mm -hmm. would come into play with all of this you know because they certainly there, there was none of that kind of science uh back then you know um so if you just had to right. have your 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 witness witnessing the the birth of the child and that was enough you know right yeah or if you know if your blood glows in the dark at least you know you're royal but <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I think they had actually moved past that assumption at, at the time I'm talking, but it's such an amazing point that I, yeah. I still throw it in. So. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm not seeing any questions come up in the box, but you are in That's the directory fine. at UW-Whitewater, um, and Indeed. anyone can reach out to you at any time if they had a question about this lecture, I would assume. Sure. Yeah. And uh, for those watching the recording, um, my email is uh, C-O-O-N-S-J at uww.edu. Um, I'd be happy to field any questions as they come in. That's great. And again, I think if anyone's like me, you're going to be mulling this over for a little while and 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 maybe be getting some questions down the road. And, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, really, really interesting story. So thank you so Good. much for sharing. Glad to. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thank you all for joining us. Again, we have another lecture on Monday. If you wanted to revisit this lecture at any time, you can just go to our website. It'll be posted up there a little bit later this week. And to those of you at Fairhaven, um, you know, enjoy and let us know if you have questions. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, try to hold still as the credits roll. <laughs>